Welcome everybody to episode 10 of our Walk In My Shoes series. Thank you to those of you that have completed the recent survey that we sent out. Um, it's been really informative and we've got some great topics coming from it. If you haven't had a chance yet, please do because it's um, really helpful to us. Today we're bringing the uh, discussion slightly away from philanthropy as a focus to explore the role of impact investing in the rebuild and recovery after COVID-19. Even before the start of the pandemic, sustainability had become a growing interest for many high net worth individuals, for them, for their families mm -hmm. and their businesses. There was already an increased desire to understand impact and make mindful investment decisions that would have a positive effect on our society and the environment. Here at Philanthropy Impact, we want to explore the role of impact investing in ESG in addressing societal issues, as well as the role of professional advisors and social impact funds in creating opportunity for investment, and how this interplays with philanthropy to create a holistic wealth management strategy for good. Today, it gives me great pleasure to welcome back our board member, Jamie Broderick from the Impact Investment Institute. And for the first time in this series, our board member, Lynn Tomlinson, who is head of impact and philanthropy at Casanova Capital, and Amy Clark, who is chief investment officer at Tribe Impact Capital. They will be discussing the rise in impact investing and effective ESG, and how this is all part of a greater societal shift towards sustainability and building a better future. As always, 30 minutes is a short session, but we will be exploring this topic again on the 15th of June. Do use the chat for your questions and join us on LinkedIn afterwards for um, any questions we're not able to get to. Um, we'll now hand over to Jamie, who is chairing our discussion today. Thank you, Zofia. Thank now, you. I'm a director at the UK's Impact Investing Institute, so I pay, I, play, I pay close attention to impact investing and sustainable investing. There's no question that it is philanthropy that has taken center stage during this initial period of intense social and economic shock, when solutions needed to be immediate and generous, and many of the charities that are delivering relief to vulnerable people are themselves under threat. But now, several months in, we can think more broadly about how to get capital to those who need it. So, a little over two months into the shutdown, let me ask you two practitioners. You are in daily contact with clients, what are your clients thinking right now? What is on their minds? What are their concerns? Are they focused at this point uh, on philanthropy or investing or both? Lynn, can I start with you? Yeah, sure. So um, what we're finding with our clients is that there was an immediate shock as we all were very shocked with them, um, with what happened during the crisis. And there was a lot of attention on portfolio valuations, etc. Um, and those who are engaged in philanthropy were trying to work out what their immediate response would be to the crisis. But I think what this um, this particular crisis has highlighted for lots of our investors, whether that's our, our private client investors or our charity investors, is that um, is that businesses don't operate in isolation anymore and there's huge systemic risks that are being built up in the system if we ignore things like you know, climate change and the um, impact on biodiversity and things like that. So we're actually starting to move on from, from that initial stage to thinking about how, how people might invest going forward. Amy, what about uh, Tribe Impact Capital? What about your clients? So you're a wealth manager, but your clients are also active philanthropy. What philanthropically? What are you seeing? Yeah, just interesting. By the way, I'm Chief Impact Officer, not Chief Investment Officer. Not <laughs> operating as Fred, um, who is our Chief Investment Officer. So just a little bit of clarity there. Um, it's very similar, actually, similarly, actually, to what Lynn just um, outlined. There was a degree of uh, shock. To start in, in terms of the speed with which the wheels came off the system. Um, I think that, that you, you wouldn't be human if you weren't shocked by the speed with which everything started to kind of unravel. I think the thing that was really interesting for us is because all of our clients are investing for the future that, uh, that we all need, you know, a future fit society and a future fit planet, planet there was an immediate and instinctive um, conversation that started with most of our clients around Okay, how do we think about the role of philanthropy, but also how do we actually increase our exposure to the businesses that are going to help us drive us through this specific issue that we're now facing um, as well. So it was incredibly, um, it was actually an incredibly interesting time for us. Um, obviously, it's the first crisis we have been through. We're a young business um, and um, we're 100%, as you said, Jamie, and you know, we're 100% dedicated to impact investing as well. So it was a really good litmus test for us actually to see just what level of um, composure our clients had. And of course they have got this incredible amount of composure with regards to their investments because they recognize that it's patient capital, it's long-term investing. So actually we had more clients asking us 
more they could do versus what they should be doing less of. Um, which I think you know may may have played out differently, you know, in, in the market more generally. But we did see a wholesale increase in the amount of clients asking how can they increase the uh, impact that their philanthropy may be having. Um, and to Lynn's point, you know, the, the sort of the firefighting philanthropy that they may have put in place. How can they turbocharge that impact by bringing on the broader wealth that they have to ensure that not just focusing on firefighting now, but they're creating obviously solutions for the future future and as we all know impact investing is actually the best vaccine that we have um, so it's been really reassuring I think is the word that I would use and so so let's let's think about that so in terms of addressing the the need created by COVID-19 so let's you know you've got unemployment a severe drop in the ec economic viability of uh, social enterprises and charities themselves I mean there's one estimate is that there's uh, up to 50% of charities are vulnerable to their merger. So how, how do you think that impact investing, if people are moving from a philanthropy mindset to a more balanced mindset, including impact uh, investing, how do you think impact investing can contribute to this rebuild and recovery? Mm. Is that to me or to Lynn? Well, let's go to Lynn for this. Okay. <laughs> well, I think, um, I mean, I think, can you tell? sorry, <laughs> if we think about the role that wealth managers play, for example, in, in building a, a better society, I think our, our role is actually to put um, investments in front of clients that, that match their values in, in some respects. And what we're starting to see is that people like Big Society Capital or The Conduit and, and Schroders and Blue Orchard are starting to think about COVID-19 response funds. And if we looked at the sort of the makeup of those funds, they might not sit necessarily in the usual investment uh, selection criteria for a wealth manager, well, um, such as ourselves, and the tribe might, might be more flexible, but I'm just thinking of some of my, my larger peers. Um, and our role, I think, is, is once those products are up and running is to make sure that they get put in front of the right clients. That doesn't mean that we might necessarily um, give them the usual level um, of advice. So it might not be a discretionary advice, but, but things like the big society capital um, response funds should certainly be put in front of the larger foundations and the, and the family office clients that we all have in our, in our client banks. And I think we need to be quite brave on this, actually, because it, it could make a massive difference. And Lynn, can I ask you if you don't have, so the Big Study Capital Response Fund is one option, but mm -hmm. among mainstream impact topics, which ones are uh, of most interest to your clients? Well, we have a um, global equity and bond impact solution, and, and that, that covers everything from, as you said, you know, effective ESG, which is I love, that's amazing, and that's something I'm going to take away from this. Um, so very effective ESG to sustainability to more of the um, more impactful listed um, investments that you can make. And I think the one thing that COVID-19 has really brought about is this um, this contribution to, to the S of ESG, so the social part, which is you know, decent jobs and, and um, employment for people, great social support in various sectors. And I think some businesses, um, listed businesses are really stepping up and, and, and you can see that, and, and others are, are displaying sort of very negative behaviours. And it's very important that the likes of Schroders and M&G and everyone else really as, um, as you know, asset owners hold, start to hold those businesses that aren't contributing to account. So I think it's different in listed markets versus unlisted. But I say the social thing has really sort of almost jumped from the environmental. Can I, Jamie, can I just add to what Lynn said as well, because there's something really interesting about what Lynn just said about the bond market in that, you know, there are impact bonds, listed impact bonds in the market that, you know, are capable of taking charity debt issuance into them. And I think, you know, as we look forward for the next 10 years and see the decade of hope, you know, there's a big question mark. Will it be the decade of debt, the destructive, positive, sustainable debt? And is that what's going to help drive a lot more of this rebuild that, that needs to happen as well? I think it's also really important to mention on this call as well that there is a sunset clause for April 2021 in the Social Investment Tax Relief legislation. So Daniel Brewer, who's the CEO of Resonance, has recently written to every basically an open letter to say to us all, can we please write to our MPs to ensure that we 
extend obviously the longevity of SITR and we have to have a conversation now about whether or not SITR in its current form and CITR whether or not in their current form they can play a more active role in helping increase the resilience in the charity sector and if they can what's the role of you know company my company etc what's the role of our of us in really getting that in front of the right clients so that it's properly funded just you know, Amy, I've already written to my MP. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you would, Jamie. I haven't received a response yet, but I wouldn't. So, Amy, I wanted to ask you, I know at Tribe, when you pay very close attention to your clients' STT preferences, you probe very deeply on what your clients care about, which are the SDGs that make the most sense for them, and so they, they establish with you a set of priorities. Has that changed post COVID, uh, COVID-19? In other words, have you found your clients who started out with one set of priorities are now shifting? For example, are, are you, as Lynn says, are you finding people more interested in the social aspect? What, what are you seeing with your clients at this point? Because I know you, you, are, you are very mindful of their specific issue preferences. What are you seeing mm -hmm. now? Yeah, it's interesting. So there's the, and Jamie's been through the process that we, we go through, so he's speaking from first-hand experience. Um, uh, and he's still smiling about it, which is even better. Um, so um, the parameters that we set in place for each client, um, we normally try and keep in place for at least a year. We don't want people kind of flip-flopping around too much because it becomes very, very difficult to therefore kind of really embed a theory of change into a portfolio but we do regularly obviously um, uh, catch up with them. Um, it's been, again, it's been really interesting for us. Our clients are actually really, really confident and comfortable with the strategies that they have in place. So we haven't seen a huge amount of deviation from strategies. Um, now, part of that is because we don't allow any of our clients to discard any of the sustainable development goals. Because you can't, it's like a Jenga pile. You know, as soon as you remove one brick, you destabilize the stack. What we do do is ask for them to really prioritize what they want to lead with, but they bring all of those goals with them because of the connectivity and interdependency. So what we've been able to do is to ensure that no matter where they may be kind of really prioritizing and focusing the, um, I suppose, the sort of the point of the sphere, um, they still have a very, very cohesive and very compelling narrative with regards to all of the different you know, issues as, as well. So Lynn's point, yes, has come through really, really loudly during this crisis, the S and E, e S and G, um, because E obviously for such a long period of time was taking the center stage, may not have been taking the center stage in terms of the level of progress we've been making on it, but it was taking the center stage. And S has come through massively now. I think what we're starting to see with our clients is this, we spend a lot of time, and, and Jamie, you, you know some of this as well, um, introducing them to the notion of systems thinking, so understanding how everything works together. Um, and what we've seen through this crisis is actually their ability to kind of really embrace what we've hopefully sort of shared with them and what they've learned to the extent that they're like, this is fantastic, this is great, now how do I do more of it? And that's been the wonderful thing, the uplift that we've seen during this crisis. Let's talk a little bit more about systems thinking. And so if you think of both philanthropy and impact investing as being part of the ecosystem, how do they complement each other? I mean, do they, are they in separate categories? Are they part of the same spectrum? Are they complementary? What do you think is blended finance? For example, the combination of philanthropic or concessionary capital with impact investing, if that makes sense. So if you, if you think, Lynn, if you think about the the complementarity between philanthropy and impact, how would you describe that and, and has it changed? So I think um, with investors, they tend to put things in buckets. Maybe that's because that's what our industry does. We find it a lot easier to do that. But I think um, if we look at the charity world, they'll be perhaps distributing a, a few percent each year and ignoring the 96%, which can do tremendous good. And I think there's a huge, there's been a lot more um, recognition in, in that world that actually what the 100% the does is, is super really important and can have a, a meaningful impact aligned with their mission. Um, what I still see is people who have buckets for impact investing and buckets for philanthropy and, 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 um, and, and the rest for perhaps ESG and sustainability. We um, and we are we look at it in the round, and sometimes we've sort of missed the mark, um, which has been really interesting because our clients have been looking at it with, well, I'm I'm going to have 
10% of my portfolio and that I want that to be really impactful and the rest I just want you to do the best you can with. So um, I think it's, and on the philanthropy side, they, they tend to not be aligning, this is on the private client side, they tend not to be aligning their, their investments as much um, as their, um, as their philanthropy, you know, alongside their philanthropic goals. But we are perhaps in a different um, business to try at the moment on that side of things, but we're definitely seeing much more movement um, from private clients particularly to, to, to sort of align mission and investment yeah. and philanthropy. What does it look like at Tribe, Amy? Are, you, are your clients, is it similar that it's, it's buckets? Uh, a little less so. Um, you know, as Lynn said, you know, we, you know, we are very different. We know we're very different. Um, you know, we, we built a destination that on, only does this. So in many ways, we're in quite a luxurious position because we attract people who are automatically through program to want to do this. So we have a number of families with us who have their investments with us and have their family foundations with them. And we support them with their philanthropy as well, because for us, it's about wealth management, all of your wealth. And that's also not just your financial wealth, it's the other forms of wealth that you have as well. Um, so we're often actually getting involved in conversations around use of property as well, um, use of intellect, use of social networks. It's, uh, Jamie, you know a little bit more about us than a lot of people on, on the call. It's a, uh, it is a tribe, it's a very different kind of in, environment. Um, and it appeals you know, to some people, it may not appeal to other people. Um, but we tend to get, um, with the capital that we have, we tend to get, uh, as a general, uh, a, a really nicely sort of knitted up approach um, to an individual or a family's wealth that they have with us. Now, granted, obviously, as we all know, most uh, private um, individuals, even the larger charities, will spread the eggs around. Um, so we often get involved in conversations about the broader wealth that they have elsewhere as well and ensuring that there's no tension or counterproductivity embedded in the different pots. But as I said, we're in a, we're in many ways in a, in a slightly luxurious position because we set ourselves up just to do this. So we're attracting people who kind of understand the, 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 um, the benefit of doing this and, and are very motivated to want to do it. And Lynn, and I think we have a lot of um, institutional type clients who might come to us for a very specific mandate and um, so somebody may come to us and say I want a 100% impact portfolio and I want it well beyond the sort of normal ESG sustainable funds that you can give so um, it is, it's really interesting to see how different segments of the market are, are actually approaching, approaching this but what I definitely am not seeing is philanthropy's done and dusted and impacted investing is the way forward. I think people are still very much um, appreciate that there's a big difference. And to your point on blended finance, which you, um, which you raised in the question, I think that's hugely important in getting some of these first time family offices, charities over the line where you've got a first loss investor. And I, I think, and that's what we're working on with the Blue Orchard Fund. Um, so it will be really interesting to see when we start taking that to some of our family office and institutional clients, the response that we get, you know, a sort of 10 year lockup for a reduced return is, um, is not distributable broadly, but we all have clients who would really, you know, be love to be involved in something like that. So. I am interested in this, this um, how you balance, if you're, if you're doing a, a concessionary return, how do you balance between the financial return and the societal return? How do you, how do you map those to each other? I mean, how would you describe that process then? So can I, yeah, Amy, if you want to get in on that, yeah. Okay, going to go for it, Lynn. You've used that dreaded term, concessionary return. Um, I'd be interested to know why you specifically you've used that term. Because <laughs> I think Lynn talked about a fund in which you would lock up your, your capital for a long time mm -hmm. and you'd be getting a sub-market return. I think is, what you, is that how you described it, Lynn. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. And that's more blended finance sort of style, isn't it? It's very, it's very specific. I think, um, I mean, we're absolutely 100% agreement with, um, with Amy that and our portfolios that had a more sustainable impact till held up well as everyone else's did, I'm sure, in this, um, during this crisis. Um, but there are certain parts of the market where the cost of capital for the in underlying investees needs to be taken into account. You didn't like that term, so could you elaborate on why you <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't like the term at all. I think it's an adjusted return. 
um, as opposed to concessionary, because the concessionary puts somebody straight away into a negative mindset. So the delivery of impact on externalities, which is an indirect financial gain for society, is likely to be incredibly high. So, you know, when you start talking about return, what kind of return are we talking about? You know, um, and, you know, is it just the direct return versus the holistic return? And then also, is it concessionary or is it adjusted? And is it adjusted for a future fit society? So I could, Jamie, you know, I could rant about this for hours, um, which is probably why you decided to use the term. <laughs> so, um, but it's just, for me, it's always interesting that, you know, it, the language that we use in many ways is part of the problem. Um, as to you know, the level of adoption that, you know, that, that we need. And I think in any portfolio, you can tolerate many different types of risk, um, as long as the overarching portfolio risk profile matches what the client's after. Anyway, sorry, Lynn, go ahead. And that doesn't fit particularly helpfully in our regulatory framework, does it? No. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Um, yes. So let's talk about um, how portfolios have done during the last couple of months. How is that? Um, because you're, you're investing in making this, the decisions you make to invest with a sustainable portfolio, you end up investing in a different segment of the market than the conventional investor does. How has that played out? Amy? Yeah, I mean, well, uh, you know, we're, we're still, as, as you, you both know, we're still quite young. So we we released in uh, November last year our three-year track record. Um, you know, the, the elusive three years where suddenly you become, incredibly, um, you become credible from a financial services point of view. Um, and we released in November, and obviously on the upside, because the markets have been fairly positive, um, we outperformed the benchmark, and we use an ARC benchmark, which is a private wealth management benchmark, so we don't benchmark ourselves against our sustainability funds, we benchmark ourselves against the kind of, you know, medium risk portfolio. So the medium risk portfolio that we had, all of them actually out, um, outperformed the markets. We do, as you know, Jamie, we don't uh, like quarterly reporting. We think quarterly reporting can drive some of the behaviours that actually restrict innovation and restrict the longer term view, but we did release a quarterly view at the end of March. In the eye of the storm, we felt it was important like we all do i think get as much data back out into the marketplace so as the markets are down everybody's down but again we were we were down um far less again than the benchmarks um which was great again it was another sort of data point that we felt added um added kind of powder to the narrative that there is a baked in resilience to this type of investing because you are focusing on companies that are well run that are creating products and services that society actually needs so in any storm, they should be able to weather uh, the conditions far better. And I think we're seeing that, you know, and, you know, so it's Lynn, you know, said earlier, Schroders are the same with their sustainable portfolios. There are, there's so much information in the marketplace now, one has to ask the question, how much more information do we need before the mainstream goes impact, not impact goes mainstream, because there's a different psychology between those two statements. Absolutely. Yeah. And Lynn, are you finding, this, uh, without necessarily putting you on the spot with respect to, um, Investment no, performance at the no. casino, but are you finding that people are getting more comfortable, or are are now comfortable that a sustainable portfolio correctly delivers returns that are at market or potentially even better than market? Yeah, I mean we've we, we've all got the same tools in our toolbox, and we and we've um, experienced exactly the same as as Amy and our peers, that they have been much more resilient over this period. And there's a huge debate about whether that's because they're underweight certain sectors. But the reality is, is that if you're looking for impact, you're investing in high quality growth companies um, that should be around in five to 10 years and, and investors don't, don't dump those in, in difficult times, do they? So um, exactly that we're seeing now. I think um, there's definitely much more acceptance that, that this is, um, something that's more relevant to lots more clients. I mean, one, one big thing, beef that I have is that um, we pay as an industry very little attention to, to the, the systemic risk in the market and lots of attention to trying to outperform it. And the reality is, I think, what is um, probably a helpful but um, consequence of this terrible situation is that um, it's very obvious that that climate risk is important to all investors, not just those who want to reflect, reflect their values. And I think the fact that this pandemic has 
cost us such an awful lot because we didn't prepare properly um, is, is a really big wake up call. And I think a lot more people will now, hopefully, this is my optimistic um, hat on, will we'll start to think more about their, their underlying investments and what role they actually play in building, you know, building back better is the big slogan, isn't it? But it's, it's a bit cheesy for me, but you know what I mean? <laughs> It's easy or no, what do you think the kinds of investments will be that will build back better? I mean, Amy, what's your view on that? You think about building, building back a better society based on the kind of leveling that's occurred through COVID and the leveling that's about to occur through climate, uh, climate change. Mm. What to you would be a vision of building back better through investing? What would that look like? You can kind of focus it really around sort of the three R's. I mean, first we need to recover. So there needs to be the investments in the recovery um, to drive us through this. Then there needs to be um, the investments in the resilience. So how do we increase our resilience to uh, better navigate these storms when they happen? Because without wanting to sound like a, a, a doomsday kind of merchant, it will happen again. You know, it's it's uh, it's likely that we will you know see more of these. Um, given what we know about the provenance of this specific virus, but also as Lynn has so eloquently said, we have the existential crisis of climate change still looming, still here, and it's happening, you know, right, right in front of us now. Um, but then it's the regeneration as well, and how do we regenerate? And it has to be a green recovery. We can't have a brown recovery. It has to be an inclusive recovery. So we need to make sure that we're bringing everybody with us as well. And that does mean actually one of the I think the really interesting narratives that's going to come through, I hope, <laughs> I really hope loudly, is how do we fast track the inclusion and the drive towards equality and equity for women and girls around the world? Because it's one of the biggest things that we can do to tackle so many issues that we're now facing um, as well. So um, for me, it's really focusing down on companies that have the solutions right here, right now, who can help us do that, do sort of deliver the three R's. And then we have to identify those who are legitimately intentionally going to transition and we have to support them to transition really quickly. Um, and then we need to have a very, very, very honest conversation about the levels of capital that are still caught up in a lot of the um, businesses out there who have no intention of transitioning quickly and are trying to maintain the status quo. And we need to have an honest conversation about how long before you how long and how much will you tolerate before you actually try to exit? Yeah. Lynn, even though you think big build back better is cheesy, I would just point out, no, it's a technical <laughs> term. No, it, seriously, it's a technical term. I know, term. I know it, it is. Used in disaster recovery, and it specifically says mm -hmm. that once you wipe out a society or a community, instead of building it back to what it, what it was, getting back to normal, it's building it back to what it should be. And I think that's really one of the most powerful concepts around. I'm very enthusiastic about Build Back Better because I think it captures some of the things that Amy just mentioned, which is um, this is our opportunity. I think everybody's convinced that the need is there and that the emotional and social and community sentiment is there. I think it's an open invitation to do something really very, very different. I think the notion of returning to normalcy uh, just isn't there anymore. So um, cheesy or no, I think it's a I think it's a really useful way to all for all of us to agree that we're not going back to where we were. We're in the process of building something that's much much more interesting. I, I noticed that both uh, John Pepin and Sophia have reappeared, <laughs> crashing up, <laughs> which, I think, which I think means that um, it's about time to wrap up. But you know, what I'm taking away from this, and thank you to both of you, both Lynn and Amy, for this really amazing discussion, is that there is enormous uh, momentum behind um, the use of capital to make constructive things happen. And that has just gotten stronger and stronger with the crisis that we've just uh, experienced. So it just feels like, from talking to you and talking to others, it just feels like this is one unstoppable trend. And I I, for one, am really pleased to be involved in it and really pleased to be working with people like you to support it. So, Amy, would you like to ask him a question before we go? <laughs> Amy? Yeah. Make it a really difficult one, Amy. Would you, would you like, would you like <laughs> us your chance to ask Jamie a question? 
I was only going to say uh, it's been lovely working with you, Jamie, and long may it continue as well. And Lynn as well. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm a, you know, we've, we've seen the FT talk about reimagining capitalism. We're way beyond that. You can't control or delete your way out. You do have to rebuild. What do you think we really need to focus on as we come through this crisis in the next say, 12 months? What are the key things that you think the industry at large really needs to focus on? You've got 30 seconds. Personally, I think, the, the, I think scale is important in rebuilding a society. And I think the amounts of capital that, that are being deployed by governments are absolutely enormous. Those, that deployment of capital needs to be focused on the future, not the past, which means that it needs to be deployed in a carbon aware manner. So I think that's one of the, the biggest categories. But I would say that all of the huge amounts of capital that are currently being deployed, whether it's by government or by industry, needs to be pointed in this direction. This is the opportunity to do it. And I think people are up for it. Great. That's really um, nice to hear such a positive um, perception that, that the glass is not only half full, it's actually spilling over. Um, <laughs> I didn't mean for that to speak, sound so cynical. Um, anyway, thank, thank you very much, Amy and Lynn and, and Jamie for, for this. It's been really uh, fabulous and it is really nice to see how positive uh, you all are. And uh, let's continue to move in that direction. Uh, uh, what's the phrase? Build back better. That's Lynn's new phrase now. Anyway, thank you very much, <laughs> Sophia. I just want to say a quick uh, apology to you, Amy. I did have it written there that you, you I'd had the correction, it's and it still came, it's still came correct, out of my brain. <laughs> I'm sorry. Fred and I are interchangeable. It's absolutely fine. We masquerade each other all the time. <laughs> But um, yeah, again, thank you all very much, Echo John, in that that was a really interesting conversation for me in particular, because this is an area that is new to me in my expertise. So I'm learning a lot from you guys from your discussions. So thank you very much. Um, we'll be back next week, next Monday. And the topic escapes me, John. I don't know. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm just so overwhelmed, by, so overwhelmed by the positiveness. Yeah, I am. But thank you everybody for joining us and goodbye. Thank you for hosting. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Next, next week it's food. Food. Future food. food. That's it. Yeah. <laughs>